Hello. In this lecture, we're going to discuss steel joists and joist girders. We'll start off by talking about some general characteristics of joists and joist girders, and then we'll talk about design aspects and considerations as well, and show a lot of pictures of applications along the way. Let's get started. Open web steel joists are lightweight shop fabricated members that have a trust web. It's basically a prefabricated truss that can, in some cases, take the place of a rolled beam. So the idea is that in a, in a, uh, a beam subjected to bending moment, most of the material, steel in our case, is needed at the top and the bottom fiber to resist stresses due to bending. So with a, uh, uh, a steel uh, joist like this, you put most of the material where that material is needed and you take it away from the web where it's not necessarily needed. So basically it's a prefabricated truss and you can see those members shown here in the roof of this small building. For a given span, uh, joists will often be lighter in weight than a rolled shape and the absence of the web uh, allows for the easy passage of ductwork and electrical conduits. Depending on the span length, joists may be more economical than rolled shapes, although there's no general guideline for making this determination. Joists are made by a number of different manufacturers and are avail available in standard depths and load capacities. And all of these uh, standards are maintained by the Steel Joist Institute. So speaking of allowing access for ducts and electrical and HVAC stuff, this is a shot out of one of the catalogs that shows the uh, depth of the joist on the left and it shows the size of the uh, uh, ductwork or conduit that can fit through the uh, the web of those joists depending on this the uh, geometry of that particular duct or conduit so you have round square or rectangular uh, ducts The lightweight of steel joists makes them an economical alternative to conventional rolled steel members when you have span lengths that are greater than around 30 to 40 feet. Where significant concentrated loads exist, however, joists may need to be supplemented with additional structural members. <clears throat> Supporting girders used uh, with open web joists may, be con may consist of other joists that are called joist girders or you can use conventional structural steel members like rolled W shapes, for instance. For greater loads and spans, heavy steel trusses may also be used. And for rectangular bays, the joists usually span in the long direction. And that's uh, common with uh, regular floor framing or roof framing that we talked about in one of our earlier presentations. With respect to fire rating, open web joists can be used in both combustible and non-combustible construction. Fire resistant ratings as long as or as high as three hours are achievable when you apply fireproofing or an appropriate, uh, include an appropriate fire resistive ceiling. Some building codes also permit for reduced fire protection of exposed steel for roofs that are 15 to 25 feet or more above the floor. So the uh, idea here is think of walking into a Lowe's or a Home Depot uh, where the ceiling is very high, maybe on the order of 20 to 30 feet or even 40 feet in some cases. If a fire starts on the floor of that building, um, then uh, the odds of the flames actually reaching the roof uh, or the ceiling uh, is relatively low. Yes, it's going to get hot up there, but it wouldn't be as hot as if it were a, a 10 to 15 foot height and the flames were uh, uh, licking directly on the steel joists themselves. So steel joists come in uh, four different variants plus uh, joist girders. Um, so you have a K-series joist, which is the default, a bar joist that's designed for uniform loads. You can use those in floors or roofs. You have a KCS series joist that's designed to support point loads. You have an LH series for long spans and a DLH series for deep and long spans. Uh, joist girders are designed a little bit differently. A joist girder is basically a joist that supports other joists. So it uh, tends to be deeper and stronger because it has higher loads, um, but uh, it's basically a joist girder is a joist that supports other joists. More information coming on that in a few minutes.
This graphic from the Architect Studio Companion provides a means for estimating the uh, depth of steel joists uh, based on preliminary information. And so you look at the span that the uh, joist has to uh, achieve, and uh, you can, uh, from there, determine the approximate depth of the joist that you're going to need to use. So it also indicates here that joist spacings range from 2 to 10 feet, uh, joist uh, common depths from 8 to 32 inches, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing I will say is that uh, with respect to joists, they're often spaced more closely together than you would see rolled steel beams. So where joists replace steel beams, um, you often have a joist spacing that's smaller than the beam spacing would be. So many of the joists use angle members for the top and the bottom cords. You can see uh, in the image here, uh, you have three different joists, the one on the left, uses uh, angles for the top and the bottom cords, but here you can also have uh, some type of a cold formed uh, section uh, that might be hot rolled uh, for the compression flange and then bars for the bottom flange or over here on the right you can see that they just use round bars for both the bottom and the top flange. Um, for the web members, they could be uh, any variety of different materials. They could be angles that are crimped at the ends, they could be round bars, or they could be other shapes. So this is an example where you have some type of a, uh, uh, a U-type section for both the top and the bottom flange. And then the web uh, or the uh, diagonal members of this joist are made up of a round bar. So this would be manufactured by taking that round bar, which would uh, come in a coil or it might be shipped straight depending on the diameter. And you would uh, uh, straighten it if it came off of a coil. Uh, and then you would uh, put it in some type of a bending press to bend it into the zigzag pattern and then it would be welded to the top and the bottom cords. Okay, this is a picture out of, uh, I believe this is Bass Pro Shops, uh, one of my favorite stores. So this roof system here has uh, metal decking um, supported by the uh, bar joists uh, and then the joist frame into the girders that are made out of rolled sections. So you have metal decking framing in this direction, you have a bar joist here, bar joist here, and those bar joists frame into this member deck back here, which would be a girder. And then that carries uh, loads into these columns and then down into the foundation. Okay, nice clean appearance. So for a building like uh, Bass Pro Shops or something like that, they didn't need to put any architectural covering on the ceiling. They just left it exposed like this. And with the white paint and uh, a clean appearance to the HVAC, it looks just fine. All right, this is uh, another uh, common big box store. Watch out for falling prices. Um, so in this case, uh, similar construction, but one significant difference. Let me see if I can show you what that is. So in this case, you have the metal decking framing this way, framing into these uh, joists, and then those joists frame into these joist girders. So the bottom flange of the joist girder there, top flange of the joist girder there. Then those joist girders carry the load into the columns, and then the columns uh, carry that uh, uh, load down to the foundation. All right, at the top of the column, we have a number of different details that can be used. Um, one thing I wanted to call out, though, is that the joists are, or joist girders in this case, you have both joists and joist girders. You have a joist framing in from this direction, a joist framing in from that direction, and those are bearing directly up here. So a bearing surface there and another one on the back side that's hidden. Uh, and the joist girders themselves, so top flange of a joist girder here, top flange of the joist girder there, they come in and they bear on this cap plate on the top of the column. So there's a cap plate there. But the, the bottom cord of the joist girder here and here is extended and uh, so that it uh, engages this tab on the uh, column face. And that uh, it's not typically welded. It could be in some cases, but it's not. It's probably not bolted either. And the reason that that uh, tab is there is to keep this joist uh, girder from uh, moving this way or that way. All right, now this picture, uh, still in a Walmart, um, is uh, similar to the one I showed before, but take a look at this detail in the center. In here, uh, in this case, you have a couple of joists 
that are spaced really close together. You know, why would they do that? Well, the reason why is that this is an expansion joint right here. So if we were to go up and look at that, that's probably some type of a neoprene or rubber type of uh, expansion joint in the building to allow for thermal movement of the structure. So they have to provide some support for the deck coming in on this side, some support for the deck coming in this side, and this has to be a break in the structure. So they put two joists adjacent to each other to accommodate a, um, an expansion joint. Now there's expansion joints in a lot of buildings that are large, or uh, if we were on campus at UC, you would see uh, expansion joints between different buildings. Uh, one of the most uh, obvious ones that I see on a day-to-day -day basis is when you walk out of Baldwin Hall into Rhodes Hall, there's a metal strip on the floor near the elevator, and that's covering an expansion joint. And there are other ones, too, you can see when you start to look for them. Okay, this is an example of a Lowe's, and uh, similar construction again, but this has a better perspective. So load path is you have metal decking that's supported by the joists. So I have a joist here and joist here. Those joists are supported by the joist girder, uh, which carries the load into this column and then down into the foundation. But one of the things that I want to call out with respect to this particular uh, image is the idea that this joist girder has a unique characteristic to it. And this is what one of the things that makes joist girders fundamentally different from uh, an actual uh, uh, joist or a, a default joist. Let me erase this ink. So at the uh, end of these joists, we have a point load coming into the joist girder. So at e every one of these locations, there's a point load coming in. This one's hidden by the sign, but it's there anyways. You just can't see it. There's another one coming in back here like that. So in order to support those point loads, the joist has to be configured such that there is a panel point at every one of those load locations. So when you order a bar joist, I'm sorry, when you order a joist girder, you order it specific for the job that you're working on, not just in terms of load, but you also have to specify the spacing of the joists that are framing into the joist girder that you're opening, that you're ordering. So that's a unique characteristic of joist girders. And we'll come back and expand on that in a minute. This building is a water park that's uh, north of Indianapolis, and uh, it's a, a site I visited with my kids uh, several years ago. And uh, when I got inside the structure, I was uh, a bit surprised to find out that this thing is constructed nearly entirely of joists and joist girders. So on the inside, you can see that uh, the roof that's a barrel vault is actually supported by uh, bowstring trusses. And uh, so you can get these uh, bar joists uh, in different configurations if you order them by special order as well. Typically they come with parallel cords, but you can get special configurations like the architect or the contractor did in this case to, to make a barrel vault type of a roof. But note that there are several different levels of trusses here. So load path uh, in this case is we have uh, metal decking coming into the bar joists here um, and then into this bar joist loads carried from these joists into these uh, joist girder here look at the web members of this joist girder to carry as a panel point at each joist location and then those joist girders carry the load into the column there's also joists coming in here from the lower roof level on the uh, flanks of the barrel vault area, of the flanks of the main atrium area. And those joists are also putting point loads into a joist girder. Uh, and note the framing of that joist girder, such as there's a panel point at every one of the locations where a joist frames in. And then those joist girders carry the load into the column, and then the column takes all of that accumulated load down into the foundations. So this shows a uh, view of the, uh, the side area uh, off of the main atrium, and you can see the joist framing in this way into the joist girders. Um, and then uh, here's a, a post that's put in to support the load coming in from that uh, joist right there. Okay, this is an interesting uh, uh, view showing this joist girder here, um, supporting 
joist framing in this way that carries load into this column and that column and then down to the foundation. So uh, let me erase that ink. And then you can see here the tabs that exist uh, at the bottom cords of those joist girders. Now note, note that the joist girder in this span here is a bit shallower than the joist girder in the adjacent span. And that's probably because the span of the girder itself, the joist girder itself, is shorter in this span so that it doesn't need to be as deep. Here's another view that shows a difference in the depth of those joist girders a little bit more clearly. So we have uh, uh, a shallower joist girder here uh, spanning a shorter distance. We have a deeper joist girder here. And then we have another joist girder up here supporting the barrel vault portion of the roof. So note that the, uh, the main webbing in this uh, uh, girder is uh, supported like that, but the joists are coming in um, at uh, a location in between where those diagonals would intersect the top cord. So additional posts or vertical members had to be put into those joist girders so that they made sure that they had a panel point in the truss where every one of the joists are actually framing in. Okay, you can see how the uh, joist girders are attached to the column. Um, in our previous images, the column actually had a cap plate, but in this case, the, the uh, column actually extends upward from here. So instead of uh, uh, having a cap plate there, they welded this T shape on. So we have a T here that's welded onto the column face there and along the flange. And then uh, the uh, top cord of the joist girder just sits on that uh, uh, flange of that T. In this case, the top flange is bolted on. You can see that clear, clearly, but uh, the bottom flange is probably not, uh, the bottom cord is probably not attached to that tab. That tab is just there to keep that bottom cord from moving side to side like that. Okay, this is uh, an interesting shot. This is in a mire, uh, probably the one in Forest Park, the one I go to most often. And uh, the reason that I found this was so interesting is that the uh, the roof actually slopes up. So if we look at this thing in section, uh, the main level of the roof comes in like this. You have your bar joists uh, in there. So joists like this supporting. My artistry is not so great, right? And then the parapet for the building is out here like this. So that's the front wall. And then the roof actually slopes up like that. And so these joists, were actually uh, manufactured with a goofy top cord. And that top cord element is there. Um, it's also there. It's also there. And uh, I think that that was uh, placed for two reasons. Um, one is so that you could let more light in. Um, you can see that there's uh, light coming in through the windows in this region here, shining through the uh, cord of that joist girder. But it, I wonder also if that uh, diagonal uh, uh, sloping region might be there to help offset some snow drifting that might uh, accumulate near the parapet of that roof. Um, just speculation on my part, but uh, something I've often wondered about. The Steel Joist Institute, or the SJI, maintains load tables that are used for the selection of joists based on load and deflection limits. These tables are available in both LRFD or ASD and are available in U.S. units uh, or in metric units. This slide shows one of the pages from the Steel Joist Institute catalog, and you can see that we have the joist designation. It's given up here on the top. So in this direction here, you have a 10K1, uh, 12K5, 16K2, for example. And then you have the span length that's given here uh, for the joist. So um, basically, the first number in the designation, say uh, looking at a 14K1, for example, is the depth of the joist. So a 14K1 would have a nominal depth of 14 inches. Uh, the uh, K indicates that it's a K-series joist, and the 1 indicates that it's the first of that group of joists. So there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Uh, K1 is just the first one. Uh, K3 is the second one, of course. Uh, K6 is the fourth one. So generally, um, that, that last number, the K1, K3, K4, K6, 
as that number gets uh, larger, then the joist gets stronger and also gets heavier. Now in each one of these cells down here, you'll see two numbers. Um, and then in some cases, those numbers are in boxes that are shaded. So for each combination of span length and joist, uh, two numbers are given. The top number is the total load capacity of that joist for that span length in units of pounds per foot. The bottom number is the live load in units of pounds per foot that will produce a deflection of L over 360. For span lengths that are shaded, that means a special bridging is required, and bridging is basically a, uh, a, a kind of bracing. So you have a joist here, a joist like that, top flange, bottom flange, top flange, bottom flange. So then the web members for your joist and bridging is basically just diagonal bracing sometimes with a bottom member like that. So that's what uh, that's what bridging is. And it's there to uh, provide uh, bracing for the trusses against lateral movement. Now, typically the top flange is attached to the metal decking. So the top flange or the top cord of these braces often has uh, a top flange, top cord of these joists often already have bracing by the decking. But in some cases, due to wind loads, you can get an uplift on these, which puts the bottom cord into compression, and then the bottom cord wants to move sideways. So that's why the bridging is required. Also during construction as well, when the decking isn't in place, then uh, bridging is required to brace the top flange too, or the top cord. Okay, as I mentioned a minute ago, the first number in the designation is the nominal depth of the joist in inches. The second is the uh, the K in those cases is the uh, designator to indicate which joist series. So that's a, either a K, a KCS, an LH, or a DLH. And then the second number in the designation is the cord designation. Okay, fabricators who furnish steel joists must certify that a particular joist of a given designation, such as a 12K1 or a 14K1, that can span a given length, 20 feet, for example, will have a safe load capacity of, le of at least that that is shown in the table. Different manufacturers' joists, a 12K1 joist, for example, might have a different uh, member cross sections, but they all have a nominal depth of 12 inches and for a span length of uh, 20 feet, for example, will have a factored load capacity of at least 361 pounds per foot. So you might order a 12K1 from two different manufacturers. They might look different, but they both should have a nominal strength of at least uh, 361 pounds per foot. Okay, a K-series joist has a web consisting of a single bent bar running in a zigzag pattern between the upper and lower cords. K-series joists are available in depths between 8 and 30 inches, and you can get an indication of uh, preliminary uh, span lengths that each one of those joists can uh, achieve for typical loadings. This is uh, a sh an image out of the Ching and Adams book, uh, which is uh, similar to the Architect Studio Companion. Okay, the basis for design uh, of these joists, with the exception of the KCS, KCS series joists, is that they're all designed to support a uniformly distributed load on the top cord. So they're designed basically as simply supported trusses, though in this case the top cord and the bottom cord are continuous, they're not pinned at each one of the panel points. The key though is that um, they're subjected to a uniform load. So that means that the top cord is subjected to bending as well as axial forces. So the top cord of the member is technically designed as a beam column. It's uh, supporting both compression and bending and that makes that uh, design a bit challenging. But you as the engineer are just going to pick joists out of a catalog so you don't have to worry about that firsthand. Okay, to ensure stability of the top cord, the floor of the roof deck must be attached to it so that it provides continuous lateral support. So typically the decking is screwed into the top flange or occasionally it might be welded in place. Okay, the load capacity of K-series joists have to be man, uh, verified by the manufacturer to ensure that there's a factor of safety of no less than 1.65 in place. Okay, KCS series joists are handled a little bit differently. They are um, uh, in place uh, where you need a constant moment or a constant shear. 
And that happens when you have point loads that act on the, uh, uh, the joist instead of the uniformly distributed loads. Since KCS series joints are designed a little bit differently, you use the design tables different than you would for a K series or an LH or DLH. Uh, to select a KCS joist, the engineer computes the maximum moment and the shear in the joist, and then you go into the tables and use these values. So that makes it different from a K series joist where you would go in and pick the maximum uniformly distributed load. If you find yourself in a situation where you uh, have concentrated loads that uh, you want to apply to an LH or a DLH choice, then you just go to the manufacturer and ask them for a special analysis. In fact, typically, um, joist selection or joist design is considered to be a delegated uh, process. That is that um, an engineer will typically go in and maybe select a preliminary joist size, but then include notes or provisions in the contract documents that says that the joist manufacturer is the one who's actually responsible for the design of the joists. Okay, this slide uh, gives a bit of detail about uh, LH and DLH joists. So they are designed to span longer distances and in the case of a DLH joist, they are actually deeper as well. So that's indicated in this chart here. Joist girders are designed to support other joists. So for a given span, the engineer determines the number of joist spaces, and then from the joist girder weight table, selects the depth of the girder. So the joist girder is designated by specifying both its depth and the number of joist spaces, the load at each of the, uh, of the top cord panel points, and then the letter to indicate uh, whether the load is factored or unfactored. So for example, if you're using LRFD and US uh, customary units, you might have a 52 G9N10.5F, uh, 52 G9N10.5F. So that would be a joist girder that's 52 inches deep, provides for nine equal spaces on the top cord, and will support a total of 10 and a half kips at each one of the uh, panel points on the top cord, each one of the joist locations. Okay, the joist girder weight tables gives a weight in pounds per linear foot for the specified joist girder for a specified length. But uh, basically you specify that joist designation and the joist manufacturer, uh, sorry, you specify that joist girder designation and then the manufacturer will provide a joist girder that is acceptable. All right, so this shows the, uh, uh, the way that the joists frame into supporting members. So there's a couple of different options, lots of different options. In uh, this case here, you can see that the uh, joists are framing into some type of a wall, either a concrete uh, um, wall like tilt up construction or maybe a CMU block wall. Uh, and then over here, they show a steel beam uh, supporting the joists as well. Um, in either case, you have minimum bearing lengths that you have to maintain. So for K-series joists, that's two and a half inches. Uh, for LH or DLH joists, you have a bearing length of four inches. Okay, the joists do have to be connected to the supporting element because you end up with uplift due to wind loads. So it's indicating also here uh, fillet welds or bolts that are used uh, to attach. And if you were using a wall or a CMU, you would have to provide some sort of anchor rod or something. Okay, so this shows uh, bearing lengths. Uh, over here on the left, you can see the joist is framing into a roll beam. And over here on the right, the joist is framing into a joist girder. And then uh, the similar detail showing uh, looks like a reinforced concrete wall or a CMU uh, over here on the left and the right. And you can see the anchor rod and a bearing plate that's embedded into that wall. So um, Okay, and then uh, the end distance is basically uh, codified so that it's the same in each case. So you have the minimum bearing length uh, that's uh, provided there. 
two and a half inches for steel, um, four to six inches on masonry. And then this bearing depth is also constant. So you can figure out how much to uh, allow for the uh, uh, elevation of the top of steel relative to the top of the supporting elements. So that's two and a half inches for K series, uh, five inches for LH and DLH series, uh, except for DLH 18 and 19, where it goes to seven and a half inches. Okay, this detail down here is showing that that bottom cord might be cut off uh, at this location. It's not needed for anything structural past that point, um, but it might be extended to the column location so that you have something to attach your ceiling to. So if you're putting drywall in, then uh, that's probably not common. But if you're putting uh, uh, ceiling tiles in, you would want something to attach those ceiling tiles to. All right, we'll finish up with some more photos. This is a picture out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah Airport. and. Uh, I was sitting at the gate waiting for my flight one day and I noticed that uh, the uh, the roof was uh, a bit unique or the ceiling was a bit unique. And I really like the framing. Um, I don't think that these would be qualified as bar joists, but they're certainly trusses. So if you look at uh, this configuration here, you have metal decking supported by these trusses and these trusses are all prefabricated out of HSS members or hollow structural sections. And I thought that that provided a really clean look and uh, looks really good uh, as far as exposed uh, ceilings go. You can see that there's some supplemental framing here uh, to support this air handler or uh, whatever that unit is. I suspect that it's an air handler. And then these trusses all frame in uh, to the column over here on the left, another column there. Uh, and uh, there's probably a column on the other side of the, uh, um, the other side of the terminal on the right. Okay, so you can get an indication of what these HSSs look like, um, how clean this truss looks. Um, you probably wouldn't design this yourself as a practicing engineer, unless you happen to have a job at a, uh, a joist manufacturer, um, but maybe you would. Uh, you could probably have this fabricated from a general purpose fabricator. Um, but anyways, it's just a good example of the use of a truss, uh, exposed architectural steel, and uh, uh, basically a good solution to the problem, at least in my opinion. Okay, this is the uh, convention center downtown, and uh, I forget why, but uh, I think there's an elevated walkway up there near the roof, and I thought this was a good uh, illustration of uh, the roof framing there, and uh, it shows a um, couple of uh, examples of uh, joists. So we have uh, metal decking uh, spanning in this direction here, framing into these joists. These joists are heavier. So they're probably an LH, maybe a DLH. And then these joists frame into the top cord of this truss. So if we look at that from a different elevation, um, here's the top cord of that truss, the bottom cord of that truss. Note that there's no panel point in the truss there because that top cord is designed to handle the, the force coming in from the joists without needing a panel point there. So here's a, a vertical member in the truss and uh, the truss configuration is just like this. So this is a uh, roof system that's built up of trusts, trusts, trusses, <laughs> sorry. Uh, some of them are joists and others are actually trusses. Um, and you can also see some bridging in place here as well. So we talked about that a few slides ago. There's an example of what bridging between uh, adjacent uh, joists uh, looks like. Okay, this of course is uh, CVG, uh, I think Terminal B. And um, if you walk in and look at it, this is a collection of uh, uh, different framing as well. So we have a uh, roof joist here that instead of having a bowstring for the top cord, actually have an arch uh, bottom cord. So they uh, look very nice. They frame in over here on the left and the right to another series of trusses. If I can say that word correctly now. Um, so, Here's those truss configurations, and then they carry the load into these columns. And then you have this opening here at the end where you have the uh, uh, roof joists, joists or the <laughs> roof trusses arranged in a radial pattern. Um, and then you can see that they're also out here in the secondary area to the right and then over here to the left as well. This is another airport. This is Denver's airport. And I think they've done a really nice job of using exposed steel in their structure. Now, Denver airport is uh, um, 
famous for the fabric ceiling. It looks like it's coming out of the clouds. It's a mile high airport, whatever. But uh, um, even if you uh, once you get past the uh, fabric uh, ceiling for the main uh, terminal and you get into some of the gate areas, there's a lot of really nice architectural steel there as well. So you have uh, joists that are framing in from these directions here into these members, which are joist girders. And then they're carrying loads down into these members. This member here actually frames into another truss. And so that load comes back over here and ends up into this member. So it's a, a very interesting load pattern, right? So you have uh, joists here, joists here, joists there, joists there. They all frame into these joist girders. They carry the load down into this truss member here, maybe over through that, and then into this column. So very interesting load path, very nice, uh, very pleasing to a structural engineer anyways. Okay, different view of the same uh, uh, area. And you can see the different elevations here. So we have one roof elevation there, one roof elevation up there, another roof elevation there. And then uh, another one up here that uh, I don't know if that's a floor area or if that's another roof area as well. So um, very nice looking, I think, anyways. Okay, this is a, a shot that I borrowed from uh, Indianapolis airport, IND. And uh, it has a really nice uh, main terminal that's composed of joists and trusses. Um, so uh, this picture is a bit uh, pixelated. I didn't take this myself. I grabbed it, I think, off of their web page, or maybe it was the web page of the architect. But uh, the, the uh, main characteristics of this, though, are these uh, tree-shaped columns, uh, sort of like a Lee Hall building that we looked at earlier in the semester. And they're supporting uh, main roof trusses that support uh, joists. So here's another view. Uh, this picture is one that I took. So you have these tree columns that frame up here and here that support these uh, uh, main trusses. So uh, let's start with uh, uh, the roof loads and follow the load path. So here's the metal decking spanning in this direction. You can see that that frames into these joists. Those joists frame into these trusses uh, at the ends. And then those trusses carry the loads back to uh, joist girders or truss girders, if you want to call them that. And then they carry the load down through the column. So you can also see bridging in this picture and then the skylights as well. So really clean appearance. Again, another use of HSS in the roof system. Uh, in this case, it looks like round HSS members instead of rectangulars. Okay, this shows a close up where you can see the, uh, the, the truss girders that are supported by the columns. So each one of these has a pin here to support uh, shear, but uh, not to transfer any moment. Okay, so with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this presentation. Uh, I didn't include any uh, example problems in this, uh, but uh, we'll work some out uh, during class time, uh, and you can take a look for the PDFs on uh, the Canvas site, too. So uh, take care. See you again soon.